this book. This book, people, they should know about it. Our strength inside. This is the proof, the irrefutable proof, the irrefutable evidence. This Quran chain. The Arabs, it's very powerful because it's the word of Allah. If all Muslims hold to this robe of Allah, no power, no force on earth can do anything to us, O oh, Ummah of the Quran. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Brothers and sisters in Islam, humanity is suffering. People are suffering. Humanity is in the darkness. People are in need for someone to show them the way out. And we Muslims know the way. It has been given to us. It is this book. It is the Qur'an. It's the word of Allah. It's the last guidance that Allah sent for man. Every Muslim knows that. It is this book. To let the people to know about it. To read it. To convey what is inside it. The early Muslims they understood and they realized the importance of conveying the message in this book and sharing the guidance that it contains and spread it to those who are in the dark. All of you, they know, or most of you know, what the Prophet ﷺ said on the Mount of Arafat, those who are present should take the message to those who are absent. The companions, they understood the message and they took this light. This book, brothers and sisters, is the solution for all the problems of humanity. People, they should know about it. This is the proof, the irrefutable proof, the irrefutable evidence about the messengership and prophethood of Muhammad If anyone comes and says, what is the evidence? What is the proof that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? Say this book. The Jews cannot produce to us the miracles of Musa alayhi salam. They cannot replay to us the Passover and the split of the sea. That miracle happened. We believe in it. It happened. But it cannot be reproduced. Only those who happen to be in the company of Moses witnessed and saw it. 
the same thing the Christians cannot reduce all the miracles which Isa, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, peace and blessings be upon him and upon his mother, upon all the prophets of Allah who preceded him and upon our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They cannot reduce all the miracles that he healed the blind and the livers and all these things. Because these were momentary, happened and, and finished, and that's it. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is not an exception. He performed so many miracles sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so many, very great miracles. I'll just mention few of them, but the greatest miracle is this one, which is still exists. The Prophet وسلم, the water, the water gushed from his fingers. There was scarcity of water. And the Prophet وسلم, he brought, he told them, give me a small pot. And he put his hand in it. And the water started gushing out. His hand became like water taps. And the water coming out. And the Sahaba, they saw that. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is one of his miracles. In the masjid, he used to give the khutbah, standing on the ground on the floor, leaning against a piece of wood, a trunk of a tree, leaning against it. And then they built for him the mimbar, the pulpit. And the first khutbah he gave. The trunk of the tree started crying. And everyone in the masjid heard the cry of the trunk. The trunk was crying like a child. Till the Prophet ﷺ came down and hugged the trunk. And then the trunk became quiet. One of the companions came to the Prophet وسلم, carrying his eye on his palm. His eye fell off. Say, see, O Prophet of Allah. He said, don't worry. He put it back. And this eye became stronger than the other one. So the Prophet وسلم, he performed many miracles. But the greatest miracle is this book. The Quran. This book changed and transformed the life of the Arabs before Islam. The Arabs before Islam, they were dead nation, neglected. No one knows anything about them. Fighting one another before Islam. They would fight one another for this, for silly reasons. Some of the battles that happened between the Arabs before Islam lasted for years. And if you ask and you want to know the reason, it is very silly. One of the famous battles is Dahis and Al Ghabra. Dahis and Al Ghabra. You know what Dahis and Al Ghabra? Names of two horses. Two horses. They were in the race, and one horse won the race. And one horse belongs to the Bian, and the other horse belongs to Abs, two tribes. And the war started. And hundreds and hundreds of people were killed. Another famous battle is the battle of Al Basus. What is Al Basus? It's a she camel. Again. So that was the situation of the Arabs. They were alcoholic before Islam, most of them. Eating the dead animals, worshipping idols, burying their daughters alive, drinking blood. All these ills they had before Islam. And this book changed their life. They were barbaric tribes.
They became the most civilized people on earth. And all of you know that when the Prophet Sallallahu he sent his ambassador to the king of Persia, Kisra or Kosra. You know what the king of Persia said? Oh, what brought you? Why did you come? You want wheat? You want flour? You want date? Because that's what normally you Arabs come for. But this time, the ambassador said, No, 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 Rustam. He's talking to the commander. No, Rustam. نحن قوم ابتعثنا الله لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد ومن ضيق الدنيا إلى سعة الآخرة ومن جور الأديان إلى عدل الإسلام ربعي سيد ابن عامر سيد رستم what you are saying yes that was before we used to be like that but today we are not the same people whom you knew before we are people are raised, born again, okay? We are raised by Allah to bring out the people from worshipping one another to the worship of the creator of man, creator of the heavens and the earth. And from the, the narrowness of this mundane and worldly life, to the vastness of the hereafter and from the tyranny and the oppression of man-made religions to the justice of Islam. These beautiful words came out from the mouth of Rabi because he was a comp another person, completely different. Islam chained him. So the topic, O oh, Ummah of the Quran, this Quran chained the Arabs, and they got rid of all these ills. And they softened the Prophet ﷺ, the same Arabs, before the, the Prophet ﷺ, before Islam, they were alcoholic, eating the dead animals, burying their daughters alive, the same Arabs. They are saying, the Prophet ﷺ gave us a nice maw'idah, exhortation, a speech, a moving speech that our hearts were leaving, jumping out from their place. And the, our eyes started shedding tears. So we felt that the Prophet ﷺ is telling us goodbye. You see how softened their hearts became? What softened their heart? What softened the hard hearts of the companions? This book. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, all of you know that how he became a Muslim. He was looking to kill the Prophet sallallahu This book chained him. The seerah, in his biography we read, they said he had two black lines on his face, Umar. Two black lines on his cheeks. Why? Because of his constant crying. They were two canals, two grooves, two traces, dark lines of the tears on his cheek. How softened his heart became very soft. If you say to Umar, fear Allah ya Umar, he falls down on his knees. It is this book that chained Umar ibn Khattab. Now, where is the chain in our life? This book, Allah said, had he revealed it or sent it down upon a mountain, that mountain would have crumbled down. If this book is sent down upon a mountain, this mountain will crumble, turned into powder. But our hearts today are very, very hard. And we read it, and we don't cry. We read it for barakah, 
We put it in the car to protect the car from the thieves. We put it under the head of the child. But do we follow what is inside? As one of our mashayikh said, you go, you find a Muslim selling haram, and you see Quranic ayah, min fadli rabbi. This is from the bounties and blessings of my Lord. And then another ayah, this is typical, selective, choose. Those ayahs were, were selected. in shakartum, la azidannukum. This is by default, but anyway. If you are grateful, I will increase you. See? Increase you what? Another branch, another shop. That's what he wants. If you are grateful, then I'll have another shop, a third shop, a series of shops. Or we read the Quran when somebody died. Not only this, brothers and sisters, can you imagine that the Quran became an, an evil omen in the life of Muslims? You know, evil omen. You know, it is shirk, of course. If you, you know, the owl, if you see the owl, you say, oh, if the owl landed in someone's house, oh my God, somebody's going to die. See? So that's evil omen. Or if someone, his eye is flickering, you know, a nerve is flickering, so oh my God, something is going to happen. Evil omens. The Quran became an evil omen now in the life of Muslims. Maybe you don't have this here, but we have it in the Arab world. You know, in the Arab world, broadcasting, television, they start in the beginning with the Quran. A sheikh will recite for barakah. But immediately after the recitation, there will be music immediately. It will be followed with music after that. And before closing down the programs, before the shutdown, also Quran. So in the beginning and the end Quran, in between, anything. Everything to please the shaitan. So people are programmed mentally that you hear the Quran at this time and this time. Any time in between, if you hear the Quran, that means someone died. And this one who died must be a president, a ruler, someone important, not any, any man. So immediately, if the Quran on the television say, A'udhu Billah, what happened? Who died? Who died? It became an evil omen, the Quran in the life of Muslims. And because of this, brothers and sisters, this ummah is humiliated. We are humiliated. We are over one billion, but we are weightless. Like the froth, like the scum. We have no weight. Why? We deserted this book. We neglected this book. When we know that this book is the one who chained the people. Our strength inside. If we want to gain back our glory and the might is we have to come back here to the book of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I left two things among you, the book of Allah and my sunnah. If you hold them, adhere yourself to them, abide by their teachings, you will never go astray till you meet me on the fountain. The Kawthar. This Quran is the word of Allah. Allah spoke it. And it will go back to Allah. You know this? Do you know brothers and sisters, towards the end of time, people will get up in the morning and they will not find anything inside. Nothing. Blank. Not only from the book, and also it will be taken out from the hearts, from the breasts. It will go back to Allah. It's the only book, brothers and sisters. Have you ever found a book challenges its reader? Have you ever found a book? It is challenging the reader. It is telling the reader, it tells the reader, go and find any mistake. I challenge you. Have you found a book like that? No way. This book, yes, challenges the reader. 
He says, go and try to find any mistake. Because you will never find. Because the one who speaks is Allah Azza wa Any other book you'll read in the introduction, in the preface, you'll see the, the, the author or the writer is apologizing huh, in advance. And then you see the second revised version. Second edition, third edition, fourth edition. He keeps revising because he, he, there, were, there were many mistakes. This book is only one. Travel anywhere you will never find any mistake, any copy. Subhanallah. So this is the robe of Allah. We have to hold to it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Stick and, and hold to the robe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If all Muslims hold to this robe of Allah, no power, no force on earth can do anything to us. I mean it. That's what Allah promised. And this deen, Islam, is going to supersede. It's going to prevail. With us or without us? If we don't do the job, Allah will replace us. Substitute us with other who will do the job. But this deen is going to reach every corner, as Allah promised. That he sent his prophet with huda guidance and the religion of truth, to make it supersede, prevail, upon any other system, any other deed, any other belief. Even the rejectors of truth, they don't like it. This deen will spread with us or without us. Imagine now, because this book has self-strength. It's very powerful because it's the word of Allah. Someone is reading it and you don't know, you don't know Arabic, but you cry. There is a hidden force, magnetic force inside. He's Ajami, he doesn't know Arabic, but when the Quran is recited, you find him like this. And maybe he's crying, though he doesn't know what is it. This is the impact of the Quran. Imagine if you know the Arabic language. Because it's the word of Allah. The Arabs before Islam, in the morning, they would be saying to one another, Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab, Oh, this is the words of the sorcerer, magician. At night, they go and start listening to him. You know this? In the morning, Abu Jahal, Abu Sufyan saying to the Prophet, You are a magician, you are a sorcerer, you are a witch, doctor, etc. But at night, the Prophet is praying in the masjid, they go and start listening. And many times Abu Sufyan, when he became a Muslim, this happened between Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl. He said, many times we ran into one another at night. I am taking a corner listening to the Quran because it moves them. And Abu Jahl in the other corner and we don't know. Just because we are afraid the day is going to break, so we have to run. Because if the people see us, what are you doing here guys? In the morning you are telling us he's a magician, now you are listening to him? So they ran many times, what are you doing? What are you doing? So promise me that you will not come the next night, see? And they promised one another. And everyone would think, he promised me he would not come. Okay? And they came again and again and again. Why? There is something attracted, attracting them. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, that in the early days of the da'wah, what was the jihad? Reading the Quran, that's it. وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا Yes, read it. That's it. Read the Quran, that's it. Because this is the book of Allah. So this is the robe. We have to abide to it. In this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asked the Muslims two things. Only two things which we can do in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number three. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا 
وتتقوا لا يضركم كيدهم شيئا two things allah demanded and requested that if you are patient facing in the face of adversities tasbiru وتتقوا and in another place allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying saying said ya ayyuhalladhina amanu sabiru what wa sabiru you should you muslim you should be patient and also your patience should overcome the patience of your enemy that means we should have more sabr than the sabr and the patience of our enemies we should not lose patience we have to be more patient than your enemy before islam there was a famous hero knight fighter he's known as amtar bin shaddat okay so one man asked him how do you defeat men how do you knock them down how do you defeat men he said so what is the the secret behind your strength he said you want to know he said yes he said put your finger in my mouth i'll put my finger in your and you bite my finger and i will be biting your finger so let us do it you bite my finger i'll be biting your finger and they started biting one's finger everyone is biting and then the man said Ay! started to cry he said i defeated the men by this had you waited few minutes i would cry but you didn't it is the sabr it is the sabr it's a matter of sabr so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in tasbiru wa tattaqu if you have sabr and taqwa la yadurrukum kayduhum shay'a their conspiracies their plotting their plans whatever they do it will never harm you i know what they are doing and their all their plots will be will fail yes yes all the plots will fail allah protects us he is the protector la ta'khudhu sinatan wa la nawm we sleep does he sleep he is watching you are planning and plotting and but allah is watching he is the protector but he needs two things he asks us two things not is is not a need he demanded two things sabr and taqwa and the beautiful hadith that this is the the way the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he drew a straight line and the shortcuts the shortcuts so the way of salvation is only one way and it is that straight path and if you want to be remain on that straight path stick to this book and the shortcuts they will take you to a hell fire so the way to the truth is only one way and it is is it short or long long very long and many of us are not patient it's a long way but it is the only way that will take you to the jannah and you know something else other muslims some muslims may allah guide them the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i want you always to remember this always eh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did like that and those guys may allah guide them you see here the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he drew a straight line right and the shortcut is say every shortcut takes you to hell and those guys are saying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying the way to the truth is only one way those guys are saying the truth is in the center of the circle in the center of the circle so i'm asking you many of you studied mathematics how many ways to reach the center of the circle please tell me how many ways to reach the center of the circle as many points on the circumference from any point on the circumference of the circle i will reach the center and that is exactly what they are saying the way to the truth as many as these breath of human beings that's what they're saying so all the ways lead to jahannam hmm? only one way leads to the jannah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam drew this and he will tell them you are telling us this who should we believe now who should we follow so the way 
to the Jannah, it's through this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this hadith which is authentic hadith in Musnad Ahmad and Al-Hakim and Sahih Sunan and Nasai, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya aqwa ma yubashir al-mu'mineen. Verily this book, Qur'an, guides to that which is the most right and and gives the glad tidings to the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, لَا يَأْتِيهِ الْبَاطُلُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَلَا مِنْ خَلْفِهِ No falsehood can approach it from before or behind it. Now, what is our obligation? What are our obligations as Muslims towards this book? As I said, brothers and sisters, many of us have abandoned this book, neglected this book, deserted the book of Allah. It is true. I don't want to embarrass you. How many of you read it today? We should read it every day for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But we should read it. At least you should read one yuzu every day. One yuzu every day. So by the end of the month, you finish it. This is your, you make it your habit. I have to read my book. Otherwise, you know what? The Prophet ﷺ complained to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he complained to Allah. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا And the messenger said, will say, Oh my Lord, truly my people took this Qur'an for just foolish nonsense. They deserted it. They neglected it. They don't implement what is inside it. They don't follow what is inside it. They don't read it. And Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he talks about the types of abandonment or deserting the book of Allah, which is known as Hajr. He said in his book, beautiful book, Al-Fawaid, he said types of Hajr, deserting. He said different types of Hajr, Rahimallah. He said the first type I want you to concentrate. He said the first type is abandoning listening to it attentively. You don't listen to the Quran attentively. The Quran is played, okay, the tape is going on, and we are talking, right? So we are not listening to the Quran. So you should listen to the Quran. And the Prophet ﷺ used to ask some of the companions to read the Quran to him. He asked Ibn Umm Abd, Ibn Mas'ud. He said, read to me the Qur'an. He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, the Qur'an was sent down on you and revealed to you, and you want me to read it? He said, I like to hear it from others. I like to hear it from others. You know the Sahaba, what they used to do when they meet, they would make some one of them to read the Qur'an. Do we do that? When we meet, say to one of the brothers, as Umar used to say, Huh? Soften our hearts. One of you should read the Quran. We don't do that. But the Sahaba, they used to do that. So the Quran was there in their life. All the time. So the Prophet ﷺ, one night, he passed by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was praying at night, tahajjud. And he was reading, and he had beautiful voice, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. So the Prophet ﷺ was listening to him, enjoying listening to Abu Musa. The second day he said to Abu Musa, had you, had you known? Did you know that last night I was listening to you? Oh, mashallah, your voice is so beautiful, like the voice of Prophet David. So beautiful voice you got. You know what Abu Musa said? Had I known, I would have made it better. Better. I would have made, I would have tried my best because you were listening to me. So the Prophet ﷺ used to listen to the Quran from others. So the Ibn Qayyim is saying that, abandoning listening to it. 
You don't listen to the Quran. You listen to it. And you can have many reciters, mashallah. Hmm? You can listen to this one, you can listen to this one, you can, but you listen to it attentively. So now, if you don't listen, that is a type of hajr, you are deserting the book of Allah. The second thing he said, deserting its rules pertaining to lawful and prohibited. Yes, many Muslims, they read it, mashallah, put it on a high shelf, but they are selling the haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, leave the riba, but they are doing the riba, but they read the book. But they are, because here they have deserted what? Implementing what is inside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is haram. Yes, we know it is haram, but what can we do? It is haram, yes, but what can we do? Subhanallah. Or you will hear, but you know all the people, they are doing it. Imagine. Because all the people are doing haram, so we are doing the haram as well. All the people, they want to go to hell. You want to go to hell? Don't you know that the majority of mankind are destined to Jahannam? The majority of the children of Adam will go to hell? That's what the Prophet Sallallahu said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection or the, the day of judgment, he says to Adam, O oh Adam, all the children of Adam in front of him, and he tells him, Allah will tell him, will tell Adam, send to Jahannam those who are destined to hell. You know how many? Can you imagine the number? Out of 1,999 to Jahannam, only one out of 1,000 will go to the Jannah. Can you imagine? So the majority of mankind will go to hell. Do you want to go with them? The majority will never be an evidence that because people, majority are doing it, so it must be right. If you read in the Quran, you will never find a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prays the majority. Many places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blaming them. Never praise them, the majority. If you obey the majority of mankind, they will lead you astray. So don't use that as an excuse. Allah said, you want to go to the Jannah? So follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Even the whole people are doing the haram. I don't care. I want to go to the Jannah. I don't want to go to hell with them. So that's the second type. The third type, he said, removing it, the Quran, from ruling and judging all the affairs of the Muslims. This is the bitter truth. This is the bitter truth. The Sharia, the book of Allah, has been replaced with what? Man-made laws. English law, American law, French law. So it has been removed from the life of Muslims. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ said 1400 years ago. The first thing Muslims will live is abiding and ruling with the book of Allah. And when did it happen in the life of Muslims? Less than a century. Less than a century only. The fourth type, he said, abandoning, pondering and reflecting on it. Yes, we read it, but we don't ponder upon it. We don't reflect we don't make tadabbur. We read it in the parrot fashion. Muslims in Ramadan, they compete with one another, right? How many times you made khatma? How many times you finished competing? But do you understand what you are reading? No, parrot fashion, do, 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 like that. No, you should not read the book of Allah like that. Get translation in your mother tongue, try to understand what you are reading. That's how your iman will pick up. That's how you can strengthen your iman. That's how you will enjoy reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last thing Imam ibn al-Qayyim said, the Quran is a cure. So it is a cure, a remedy. 
In this book, the Quran, there is a remedy and cure. If you read it, it is a cure. It will heal you by the leave of Allah. One of the surahs of the Quran, surah number one, Al-Fatiha. This has many names, Al-Fatiha, Al-Hamd, Al-Shafiyah, the healer. One of the names of it, Al-Shafiyah, the healer. And we know in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was in the company of some of the group of the companions. And they came to one of the tribes of the Arabs, and this tribe did not welcome them. They didn't receive them well. So they encamped not far from the dwellings of this tribe. And what happened? What happened? The chief of the tribe was bitten by a snake. Listen to this. He was bitten by a snake. So a woman came to the, to the companions and she said, the chief of the tribe was bitten by a snake. Anyone among you can give him spiritual cure, which we call ruqya, ruqya, spiritual cure. Abu Sa'id said, yes. But we will not do it freely. We will not do it free. She said, we'll give you a flock of sheep. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went with her. And what did Abu Sa'id al-Khudri do? You know what he did? The venom of the snake already in his body. The poison already in his body. He started sucking the wound and spitting out the blood. And he was spitting on the wound, and he was reading Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, the Shafi'ah. And he read it seven times. After seven times, the man was healed immediately. And they gave them the flock of sheep. And when they reached Medina, they told the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu told them, give me part, my share, give me my share. The Quran is a shifa. Many of us, when we have headache, when we have anything, what do we do? We rush to the doctor, right? We don't say, let me read on myself. Let me put my hand on the place where I feel the pain. The Prophet ﷺ said that you put your hand on the place of the pain and you say what? أعوذ بعزة الله وقدرته can you memorize this dua? أعوذ بعزة الله وقدرته من شر ما أجد وأحاذ Which means I seek refuge and protection in Allah's power and might from what I suffer, what I feel, what I'm going through. Just put your hand in that place and say this dua three times. And it will just go like that. If it is coming from your heart, of course. Because the Qur'an is a shifa. Everyone knows the Fatiha. May God forbid. May God forbid that this never happens. Now, it happens. We don't want it to happen. That someone is bitten by a snake and they bring him here and say, Oh, Sheikh, come read. What do you think? Inshallah, Allah doesn't expose me. Yeah? Maybe he will die in front of me. Huh? Why? Because we'll be reading it just like that. Not from thee. Not from the heart, but when Abu Sa'id read it, MashaAllah, the man after seven times was healed just like that. So this is the Quran, Shifa. We should not desert it. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept our deeds and your deeds. May Allah Azza wa Jal increase our knowledge and your knowledge. May Allah protect you. Amen. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have a question and answer session. Uh, there's a question from the sisters, we'll just take this. Whoever Allah guides and whoever Allah misguides, or it should be, does not guide, leads to go astray. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulullah wa ala ala sahbihi al-mada. The issue of the Qadr, it has been addressed by the scholars, Muslim scholars. And the answer is there. The components of Qadr, or the integrals of Qadr, 
right knowledge, writing, will, and creation. These are the four components that constitute the Qadr. If you understand them all together, then the Qadr issue, inshallah, will be clear in your mind. No Muslim will argue about the knowledge of Allah. Truly, a true Muslim. So Allah knows everything. Of course, apart from these deviant groups. If Allah doesn't know everything, what we do, that means he is ignorant. Can you attribute ignorance to Allah? Never. So he knows. Because he is the creator. He is your maker, and that is rational. When I made this, I know about it. That's how I made it. So I have to know. Otherwise, I'll not be able to make it in the first place. So knowledge is essential. And because I know these things, that's what Allah said. Based on his divine knowledge, he commanded the pen to write. And that is the writing. And the writing of the Almighty Allah has nothing to do, will never interfere in your choice. It will never interfere in your choice. Because Allah's writing, which is in the Loh Mahfud, the preserved tablet, it is unknown to you. Anyone saw the preserved tablet? Anyone read it? No one. And that writing will not be used against you. Allah will not on that day say, you'll go to hell because I knew and because I wrote. He will not use that writing. There is another writing which will be used against you. You know, there was a writing in the Loh al Mahfud. They were writing when you were, you were in your mother's womb. And there is another writing when you reach the age of maturity. That writing will be used against you. Will be identical, the same as the example of the headmaster of the, the, the principal. The principal came and he asked the teacher, what do you think, what do you expect the result? He said, this guy is smart, he's getting A, distinction, C, C plus, fail. So now the principal said, I trust you. Announce the result without giving them a test. Those whom they failed, he will file a case against them in the court and he will put them, the principal and the teacher behind bar in the jail, right? He would say, sir, I studied. I worked hard. You didn't test me. But now, if the teacher wrote in a piece of paper in the, and put it in the locker, in the drawer, this student is A, this student is B, this is C, this is fail. And the result came the same. Did the writing of the teacher interfere in the failure of the student? Tell me. It didn't interfere. So you failed because you didn't study, right? Similarly, Allah's writing because he knew, that's it. And that writing, he will not be used against it. There is another writing here on this day. The result, your piece of favor came exactly as he predicted. There is another writing which the angel will write it after you do it, after committing that deed. That's why in the Day of Judgment, true paper will be given to you. Iqra kitabak. Read your book. Is there any mistake? Did the angel write anything that you didn't do? And you know what the kuffar would say? مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا وَأَجِدُ مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Why? How amazing this book! There is nothing that we didn't do except that it is jotted, recorded. Then no one will say, this thing I didn't do. No, you did it. You drank alcohol in day so and so at time so and so. You committed zina at this time. And you have to confess. And the amazing thing about people, we never found a person using the writing to justify his doing or his acts of righteousness. No one will say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, we, we prayed Maghrib, it is Maktub. Have you heard this? Have you heard the Muslim say, Alhamdulillah, I prayed Maghrib, it is written, which is true. 
you will find people using the writing as excuse only. When they do something wrong, you know what I can do, it is written. To justify their mistakes only. No one will say it is written, that's why I prayed Maghrib. It is written, that's why I, I read the Quran. It is written. So it is uh, the nature of man to find a scapegoat. To find a, a way out to justify his drawbacks. Okay? Now, the components, the will of God. If we say the will of man is independent of God's will, do you know what does it mean? That means I can do things against his will. And if you do things against his will, what does it mean? Tell me. He's weak. It means he's what? He's weak. That's why one of the Mu'tazira, one big towering figure, and he was pious, righteous. A Bedouin, you know the Bedouin? Those who they lived in the desert. He came and he tied his she camel by a column, a pillar. And he went inside the masjid and the thieves came and took the camel. So he came to the sheikh and said, Oh sheikh, please pray to Allah that uh, I get back my camel. So you know what the sheikh said? He's one of the Mu'tazila. The brother is impressed by them it seems. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, listen now. He said, Oh Allah, Allahumma innaka lam tasha li naqati fulan and tusraq faruddha alayh. He said, Oh Allah, you did not will, listen, you did not will for the she camel of so and so to be stolen, so please bring it back. You did not will that to happen. The Bedouins said, What a horrible sheikh you are. You're a stupid sheikh. You are very stupid sheikh. Now my camel, I will never have it again. I will never see my camel again. He said, How? He said, Listen, sheikh, do you know what is coming out of your head? You said, Oh Allah, you did not will my camel to be stolen, right? He said, Yes. So he didn't will it, will for my camel to be stolen, and someone took it against his will. And he couldn't stop it, right? Now he wants to bring it back. He cannot, when he failed to, to protect it in the first place. He failed to protect it in the first place. How can he bring it back? And this Mu'tazili, he dropped. <laughs> no answer. You know the man, the answer from the man was fitrah. Fitrah. Because the Mu'tazila, the will, they understand it is only one will. And I'm sure the Sheikh mentioned two wills yesterday. The universal will and the legal will. Things they happen on this world with God's will. Nothing against his will at all. But either legally or universally. The universal will, which is irada kawniya, this may be something he doesn't like. And maybe you ask, why does he allow it? There is a wisdom behind that. There is a wisdom. Imagine no germs, no microbes. Will be there medicine and doctors? Tell me. We don't need them. We don't need the doctors if there are no germs, no viruses. No need. So they should be there, right? So we have schools, we have medicines, we have laboratories, we have everything. He will only ask you when you have a choice. He told you, come to the masjid. You know, if someone holds the gun, and put it in my head, say, bow down in front of this idol, and I did like this. You know, he will never ask me. And I will not be held accountable in front of Allah. You know this? Because I didn't do it with my free will. Don't you know that Ammar ibn Yasir? Ammar ibn Yasir, they were torturing him, the mushriks. And they say, we will not let you go until you insult Muhammad wasallam. And he insulted Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he cried. He said, tell me, when you say that, what, how was your heart? What was inside? He said, don't ask me about that. I only say it by my tongue. To say, because I couldn't endure the torture. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? In'adu fa'ud. 
If they torture you again and there was no way to escape by, except by insulting me, do so. You understand now? So Allah will not hold you accountable unless you do something by choice, not under compulsion. I remember one year, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen is one of the scholars who passed away. Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen in the, king, in the kingdom of Sheikh Albani, rahimahullah, all of them. A man came and said, Sheikh, my wife, listen sisters, don't do this. He said, my wife locked the door. We are living in a remote area. And she locked the door and said, I will not open until you divorce me. Give me talaq, otherwise I will not open the door. I will leave you rot inside. Remote area, okay? No water, nothing. I will leave you inside until you die. Give me my talaq. I want to hear it. What to do? He gave the talaq. He came to the sheikh and said, what should I do? He said, the talaq is invalid. It didn't happen at all. Because you were under compulsion. No talaq happened. Second thing, one of the components, the third component is the creation. The creation. Allah is the creator. Listen, brother, to the Mu'tazila. You know what the Mu'tazila said? Man creates his own actions. Listen to this now. I'm throwing the pen. This is an action, isn't it? I'm throwing the pen. This is an action. The Mu'tazila is saying, I created this action. Say, well, let us analyze it. Let us discuss what you are saying. What is an action? An action constitutes of four components. Will. I decided to throw it. So the will. I made up my mind. Second thing, strength. Have the strength to carry it. Third component, time. Fourth component, place. These four components together constitute what? Action. Which one I created? Did I create the will? Come. Who created it? God Almighty, Allah. Did I create the strength and the muscle? Who created it? Come on. Brother, who? Say it. I wanted to come out. No, no, this one. Who created it? Allah. Who created time? Who created place? So who created the action? Allah. Man did not create the action. The question now, so what did man do? Man used the created strength and the created will to perform that action. That's what he used. And I will be held accountable in front of him if I misuse this strength or if I use my will to do something that displeases him. So nothing happens in the kingdom of God, of Allah, that he doesn't know about it. Nothing happens against his will. And he is the one who created everything. So everything is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the issue of writing, I'm sure the hadith mentioned expanding the lifespan, right? If you do good deeds, that will expand your lifespan. So your question, how it will expand my lifespan? The scholar, they say this thing. They said Allah has set for human beings two limits. Two limits. Minimum and maximum. And this is un unknown to you. You don't know it. It is unknown to you. So if I do good deeds and I be nice to my family, I be nice to this, I will reach the maximum. And it is unknown. Bear that in mind. If I don't do this, if I cut relation with my relatives, I will only have the minimum. It's not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later go and changes. It's already finalized. But it's up to you now. You don't know whether you reach the minimum or the maximum. Work hard. Do the good deeds if you want to reach the maximum. Because the hadith, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they explain one another. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu they explain one another. The wife of the Prophet Sallallahu she said, Allahumma atil umra abi, abi Sufyan wa akhi Muawiyah. One of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu She said, oh Allah, extend and expand the lifespan of the lifespan of my father and my brother. 
The Prophet ﷺ told her, Ummu uh, Habiba, he said, you asked something which you already finalized. He wanted to correct her that don't think so now Allah will change what has written already. So that is one hadith explaining that whatever Allah decided, it's already there. It's not something that's why I find many Muslims on 15th of Sha'ban. They do that. Oh Allah, if you wrote in the reserve tablet that I'm going to help, please change it. They do this, Muslims. This shows that they don't understand. Everything has been finalized, everything has been set. Wrote, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew it. And then the other hadith says, it will be expanded. So is there any contradiction? No, no contradiction. It's not contradiction. Don't you know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, nothing stops the qadr from coming down except the dua. What stops the qadr from coming down? Only the dua. Now is the dua, isn't the dua part of the qadr and qadr? It is part of it. I don't know what is going to happen to me tomorrow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the ability and the strength to make dua at this time. Oh Allah, grant me health. Oh Allah, save me. Oh Allah, do this. I'm making dua. So this dua is going up. Okay? This is what I'm saying. This is something hidden. You don't know it. The writing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wrote things in the qadr, in the preserved tablets, because he knew this is going to happen. He knew that this is going to happen. But he did not force you to do this. You have to understand the difference. Allah's writing is not forcing you to do it. It's based on the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will be rewarded according to your actions, what you do. But at the end of the day, it is hidden. You don't know it. That's why Umar said, I carry, I'm always preoccupied only by the dua. Because I know I'm, going, I'm a gainer anyhow, whether this dua is responded to here in this life or uh, in the second life. So the qadr, also on top of that, is the secret of Allah. And that's why the Prophet Wasallam said, you should not go into great depth. Why? Because then the shaitan tries to to utilize this and try to create doubts because you have to understand that Allah is adil and just. So no one will enter the hellfire when he have any excuse. No one. So all these people when they enter the, the hellfire, they know. They, they deserve the hellfire. They know it. Because they are going to hellfire because they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs>